Hello and welcome to Rock Paper Swords, the historical action and adventure podcast. My name is Matthew Harfey. And my name is Stephen A. McKay. What's your name? Stephen A. McKay. Oh, okay. It cut out when you were doing it. Oh, did it? <laughs> yeah, it went, it went funny. Yeah. Um, you should know by now. Oh, God. Okay. This is um, our second episode of answering readers, readers, readers and listeners. Readers' waves. Um, readers' wives. <laughs> reading readers' wives. Well, back to Stephen Savile. <laughs> Let's start again. This is the second episode <laughs> of us answering listeners' questions that they posted on social media. And the first question of um, the questions that we have to answer is from Andrew Hall. And he says, a question for you guys, which period in history has been underrepresented in historical fiction? And would you consider writing for that period? Go. Very good question. And this was one that I discussed with my new editor at Canelo. Because he basically just said, would you like to work with us? And I said, well, yeah, what is it you want? What would you want me to write about? So one of my thoughts was ancient Egypt. Now, I know there's there's books by the likes of uh, Christian Jack. But yeah, uh, and I think um, Wilbur Smith's written stuff about Egypt as well. And but Recently, but, Peter yeah. Gibbons has just released one. Is that not a fantasy? I think it's fantasy, but set in Egypt. I think so right. it's like historical fantasy. Right. Uh, I think so. I mean, considering how interesting Egypt is, I mean, the background in my laptop actually is the Iron Maiden cover from Power Slave, which is ancient mm -hmm. Egypt. And everybody loves ancient Egypt, don't they? I'm sure you do. <laughs> is it, I, I swear, sort of. I mean, it's, it's a magical place. It's... Just in your imagination, that you can let it run riot. And I thought that would be a really good period to write a trilogy about, or however long a series, but it would take an awful lot of research because it's so different to what we're used to in, you know, England, Scotland, Britain, green and pleasant lands, isn't it? And we live here, so yeah. we know what it's like. So to write about Egypt and the deserts and stuff, would be a completely different thing. It would take a, an awful lot of hard work to uh, really represent it properly and do it justice. Yeah. But, I mean, the stuff I read from Christian Jack, it wasn't very good, to be to be honest. I mean, I think some of his stuff's good, but the ones that I read were not particularly good. And I think it, it's there's an opportunity there for somebody to probably make a lot of money by doing so a really, sounds, really good series. So it sounds like that's that's your... Thing that you've answered the second part is that you would like to do that, but it'd be difficult to do. Yeah, definitely. But, so I think there's other uh, similar. So if, if you start going back into lesser known parts of, I think it's down to being maybe they're lesser known or more difficult to access. But I'm thinking like lots of the South American and Central American, North, you know, like the, from the Aztecs to the Mayas and the Incas and all that. I don't think I've read much historical fiction based around um, those places and the, you know those civilizations but of course they're huge civilizations with cities and you know just like the very similar to the uh to the the ancient egyptians well, yeah, you know, the the totally different culture and the, and the ziggurats and the pyramids and all yeah, the stuff and the giant heads and, and yeah yeah so they've got loads the big of stuff spheres the, the stone spheres that are like the size of a house and stuff like that and nobody yeah. knows how they were made so I think things like that so places that are sort of lesser known and more distant to western Europe I guess um so you know places like you know the Easter Island and and mm. the, the Fiji and those sort of places as well you know New Zealand but before Westerners arrived there you know those the Polynesian islands I mean there's there's those sort of places that they, they appeal to me as in that they're distant and and unusual and almost like mysterious. a fantasy world mysterious yeah. but at the same time like you say um, it would be incredibly difficult to to research and also I think nowadays. In the way the world is, it's the sort of thing that if 50 years ago we were doing this, we could say, well, I'm going to write a book about the Polynesian people uh, a thousand years ago, um, and we would just do it. But nowadays, I think people would not be happy with white middle class guy from England writing a story about the indigenous people of the Polynesian islands or, or the ancient Aztecs or the ancient Incas or whatever. So I think life 
maybe it's become a bit more complicated in terms of what you can and can't write about. And I think the danger would be that you would you would basically just be writing a, a westernised action adventure story because that's Ex- all we know. Yeah. There's no way to know what their life was like on Easter Island when they were making these massive stone heads or whatever. There's a, there's a film, um, I think it's directed by Kevin Reynolds, who, interestingly enough, was the director of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, which is one of the, <laughs> someone mentioned in one of the questions that we haven't got to. Um, but he also went on to direct, I think it's Reynolds. I mean, it's Kevin something. It's not Kevin Costner, but um, he he went on to direct Waterworld as well. But he mm. directed uh, a film called Rapa Nui, which is actually set in, um, I think, the East, Easter Island and the Polynesian Islands. And it is, I think it's like the only sort of mainstream big movie that I've seen set. And it's and it's before, um, you know, the white mm. man arrives and it's all about the, the, the you know, the people of the, of the, the place. And uh, the other thing I'm thinking of is Apocalypto as well, which is a great Mel Gibson movie, which is actually set in the, I think it's the Mayans um yeah, probably. Was that good? Um, Have you seen that? It's really good. Yeah, yeah it's really, really, really good. Yeah, and um, that's actually all, all in the native language of the Mayans with subtitles. And it's before, at the very end of the movie, spoilers, but at the very end they sort of see the the, the conquistadores arriving, you know, and it's sort right. of, but it's, but it's pre-conquistador. And so that is an unusual um, story. And it's really good. Really, really, but, but really again, worth a watch. The, it's, it's almost fantasy though, isn't it? I mean, it really is fantasy actually because we don't know what they felt like and they're so far away from us and how we live today. It's not quite like the Vikings or the Saxons or the Alfred the Great who are not that different from us. You know, that's the other side of the world, a completely different culture. For one of us to try and write that, I'd love to. And it's I would interesting. Love to some, yeah, interest, it's interesting to, interest. to wonder... It is interesting to wonder how different because I I wonder because often I wonder or I think you know that actually we write about like you say Vikings or whatever and we write them as if they're kind of like us mm. because humans are humans right so people yeah, are people you love people love their children and they love their wife and you or hate things and yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah all of those things are the same mm. but in terms of the way they think about religion and spirituality yeah. and and all of that I don't think that we get it you know i don't i think we it's it, we can't put ourselves in those in that mindset exactly in the same way that i i struggle to even understand how modern day um religions uh, how people that are very religious in other parts of the world or even in this you know even in the uk i i struggle to kind of put myself in the in the mindset of someone who's very religious because i'm not very religious but i think back in in history pretty much everybody was religious to some extent or they had their own you know, thoughts about religion because religion was everywhere and it was an answer for everything. And so, anyway, yeah, I don't know. You don't sound very spiritual at all, Matthew. I'm not. No, I'm sorry. So you don't have a hammer necklace around your neck, no? None of that. Mjolnir? No. No. <laughs> Some Viking you are. Yeah, sorry. So Peter Gibbons, the author... Um, actually, Peter Gibbons, who's written um, Viking stuff, and um, we mentioned just a, a, a while ago about the he's written a, a book about um, I think it's like a fantasy ancient Egypt thing. He's written a question. And he says, "Hi lads, each pick a character from one of your novels to fight Uhtred of Bebenberg, Bernard Cornwell's famous character, in a duel to the death. Explain why you pick the character, and if you believe they could win." So. Okay, well, I think we obviously believe they could win, don't well, we? Obviously, or, obviously. Yeah. I uh, mean, Uhtred's a big girl's blouse, isn't he? Well, he's really? an old man now. <laughs> oh, well, I, well, what do you mean by now? <laughs> <laughs> it's all a thousand years ago, right? So, um, well, he's even older then. He's, he's very old now. I So I think, um, I don't know who I'd have to fight him. He always beats Vikings, otherwise I'd put um, he always beats everyone. Viking against He beats everyone, that's true. So I think that's the answer. It depends who's writing the story. If I'm writing it, my character um, yeah. wins. Um, I'd put Beobrand against him at his peak. I think Beobrand and Uhtred are basically the same um, mould of character. And some would say, possibly, even that Beobrand, you know, could be the forebear of Uhtred because in the same part of the world, who knows, you know, how that genetic line 
falls. Um, but I think Bear Brown would beat him if I was writing the scene. Um, but I think if um, Bernard was writing the scene, I'm pretty sure Uhtred would win. But I think what would happen really is they'd fight until they're both tired, then decide to go to the mead hall and drink Have a, a drink. lot. Yeah. Um, and just decide not to kill each other because they would see kindred spirits um, and they would neither neither of them would do anything bad enough to want to kill the other. <laughs> <laughs> what about you? Who would you have fighting him then? Well, Uhtred's got uh, one real weakness, hasn't he? But like James Bond. Women. He like, yeah, he likes the women, but too much. So I think I would just pick any one of the, the female characters, Matilda from the Forest Lord series or Queen Narina from the Warrior Druid. He's killed a few series. women, though, hasn't he, in his in the in his fights. Yeah, but if they were a Princess Aeth as well, he would be all over them like a rash. Because that's just <laughs> what Uhtred does. So I think if they were expecting it, they could definitely beat him. So I would pick a woman and Uhtred would lose. There you go. That's a good I was answer. Going to say, I was going to pick one of the dogs, uh, Bellicus's dogs, like Kai, but I don't know if a dog against Uhtred with a sword no, would be. I think Uhtred uh, would just would fillet the dog. Yeah, up, I think. He'd get bitten, yeah. but he'd kill it. Yeah. Yeah, I think a woman is the way to go. That's that's a, a definitely a good answer. That's all of our weaknesses, isn't it? Well, mine, mine well, anyway. Definitely. My wife can woman. quite easily defeat me. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Um, so Mike Pickersgill actually asked the interesting question of, um, what is the square root of three, seven, eight, nine, oh, four, five? And the answer is 1946.5469427. So there you go. Easy. Um, easy. Yeah. I just did that in my head. Stuart Welsh asks the question, was there a factor behind your decisions to write in the historical periods that you have done? And what was the decision, I guess? Well, I chose the period I did for the Warrior Druid series because, well, partially because there's not much known about it. There's no historical records for that, kind of the Dark Ages, as it's called, for that exact reason. So you can kind of make a lot of stuff up yourself and nobody can say you're wrong. And mm -hmm. similarly, the Druids at that time, well, nobody can say you're wrong with the how the religion worked at the time or, you know, what they knew and what they didn't know. And also I wanted to have a Roman centurion in it and he fitted perfectly at that period in time. So it, it was the best of both worlds for me with Druids and Roman centurion. It just yeah, it's a great, perfect. Yeah. It's a great sort of crossover time period. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I um I chose the Serpent Sword, um, the, the Benicia Chronicles period, more based on the location than on the time period. So when I first started writing, it was because I I used to live near Bamburgh Castle, and I saw which a is program Bebenburg. at Bamburgh Castle, which is Bebenburg, yeah. And so I I discovered through a, a documentary that Bebenburg was an important place right back in the seventh century. Um, and I wasn't really aware of that. And so that that then sort of sparked my imagination. So that's why I started writing about that period. And I knew a bit like you with the, with, you know, you said you didn't know anything about the, the Alfred, Alfred stuff yeah. um, Stuff until you started researching. It was the same with me. I started writing the story and then thinking, oh, I better go and research and um, finding out, you know, obviously still still finding out stuff now years later because yeah. there's a lot to learn. Um, but yeah, that was why I started. And then I realized that there were very few books written about that exact period as well. So there are lots of books about Vikings. Um, and there's there's quite a few, you know, there's lots of books about Romans. There's a few books now, uh, you know, around between the Romans and the Vikings, but not as many. Um, and there certainly were very few around the sort of seventh yeah, 10 century. 10 years ago or whatever there was. Um, yeah, there, there was, there, there were, you know, you got a few sort of end of the Roman period um like the where you're writing you're about like now, mine, but yeah. again not not many not many of those so it really is an unmined period actually that um between the sort of the fifth to eighth century um there's not much written i wonder why UK, that anyway. is i wonder because to me it makes I it think, easier because you can i make think it's stuff because up. vikings i think because vikings is such a uh a, a big um i don't know what was emblematic thing you know the, the the big viking ships and all of that and so 
And I think when we were at school, we studied the Romans and we studied the Vikings and the Normans and then the Tudors and then the Second World War mm. or the First World War. That was it. There was nothing in between. So yeah. I didn't really know. I don't really know anything that falls outside of those big blocks of history that you study at school. It's very yeah, difficult. And so we I think... did like Robert the Bruce at school and uh, more, well, yeah, yeah. Get the Scottish history and the Blitz, mm. uh, Claybank Blitz and stuff like that, where the Germans bombed the place in the yeah. Second World War. But I would have loved to have done Vikings. We did the Normans. Uh, we did some Vikings. We never did anything like that, and I wish we did. I would have loved to have done so. even Romans. Uh, there was nothing really as interesting as that. Maybe we didn't do much of school. Maybe it was just in books that I had, like as a kid. I remember, you yeah. know, books, but maybe the books my parents bought me or whatever. I don't, I don't know, but I do remember reading about Vikings and Romans and stuff. But no, they certainly never made. I mean, you can obviously we try and hopefully succeed to make history really interesting and exciting. And at school, we never did anything as interesting as that. It was all boring. Well, you, whatever we did at school, it wasn't. It didn't. I mean, I obviously liked history. I still do like history, but um, yeah, I didn't. I ended up flunking history right. O level as it was when I was doing it. So GCSE, I failed history. No, I never realised that. I didn't realise you were as thick as that, Matthew. I, I passed mine. <laughs> I failed. I failed um, English literature as well. <laughs> it's my Makes claim sense. to fame. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so, no, oh, I, I'm saying Robert the Bruce is born there. That's not what I meant. I just mean the way, yes, it, was, exactly what you the way it was presented to us You're at school. Patriotic. <laughs> just the way it was presented at school, it was born. And then I watched Braveheart, and it was now it all makes sense. Well, yeah. It's historically yeah. accurate. It's exciting. <laughs> and it drew me right in. So perfect. Yeah, it's like like Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, perfectly historically historically accurate. Yeah. yeah. Robin of Sherwood, it. it was all just Completely real. Perfect. Yeah. Conan the Barbarian. It's exactly what history was like. Well, in the Hyperborean age, maybe. Absolutely. Perfect. <laughs> Chimerian warrior. Right. Um, Andrew Maxwell asks, what is your favourite book that you've read more than twice? And he then says that his is Stonehenge by Bernard Cornwell, which I have Stonehenge. to admit I could not finish when I tried but to read it. It's funny you should say that because I, I did finish it, but I never thought it was particularly good compared to his other books. So, yeah, it just shows you the difference in tastes, Andrew. It does, yeah. Obviously, I absolutely loved it. But I, again, I read it when it first came out. I, I don't know when it came out, but it's at least 20 years ago, probably 25 years ago. And I think if I read it now, I'd probably find it completely different. So I maybe should reread it. Absolutely. But to answer the question, I don't read many books more than once. Uh, Lord of the Rings, I've read more than once. But I think The Magus by John Fowles, I've read that uh, once, I th once or twice in paperback and once on Audible. And I absolutely love that book. And I've read it like 10 years apart each time and get something different out of it each time. And it's such a good book. So so I've never read that. So I'm, that's going to have to go on my to-do list. Well, it's a very, very thick book. So you'd, yeah, you'd probably be better reading it in Audible. It's so good. Uh, especially when I was young. I think I was in my 20s when I first read it. So inspiring. And it was one of the books where I, I think I was in tears by the end. Of, the actual ending. It was absolutely so powerful. But then the second time I read it, that power was gone. But it was really? a, yeah, well, you knew it was coming. Well. You know, but it, it can it still hit you, hit you sometimes. Yeah, exactly. It hit you in a completely different way because you were then ten years older. And then I listened to the audible version a couple of years ago like in my mid forties and again it hit me in a completely different way. And it's uh, yeah, it's an excellent book. So it won't it won't come as any surprise to you. That one of the books that I've tell read me Lonesome than... Dove. <laughs> Lonesome Dove. <laughs> and so Lonesome Dove by Larry McMurtry um, is just an amazing book. You have to read it. Everybody has to read it. I have read it a couple of times, and I listened to it on Audible just recently, and it actually made me cry. And I knew what was coming because – and I was walking the dog along by the canal, bloody tears. Yeah. Because I – because – you know, things happen in the book and it's a, a massive book. And so by the time after listening to 36 hours or something of the audible 
thing you know once you're 33 hours in or something and a character you know, dies or whatever it's it's pretty difficult not to be cut up about it because you're there with those characters again even though you know it's coming yeah i think it's um, funny the audible it's brilliant yeah the audible experience definitely moves you in a different way it's not better yeah. but it's, it's definitely different it's definitely different and it, yeah, yeah. And it really it really hit me in right in the feels again yeah so there's, there's a couple of other books that i would read um, that I would recommend as well, and that I've read more than once. Um, Mythago Wood by Robert Holdstock. That's absolutely genius as well. Um, and uh, there was something else I was thinking, but I can't remember what it was now, so I'll just leave you with those two. Oh, Excellent. Legend. Legend by oh, David, David Gemmell. Gemmell. Yeah, David I've Gemmell. probably Legend. read some of his. And, yeah, and Philip K. Dick. I'm sure I've read mm. his more than once. Again, audible versions. Excellent. Yeah, so great, great books there. Oh, it made me want to read those books again. Moving on then to the final question of the episode, which is Gary Ball. I don't know how you pronounce the surname. But I would imagine say... it's the same as the bowl you eat your cereal out of. Okay, well, it's B-O-A-L. Boal. How else, how else, boal. How else boal. would you pronounce it, Matthew? Well, I speak Spanish, so in Spanish it would be Boal. <laughs> So I automatically see it as pronounced in a different way. I just, so I Gary, Gary Boal. So. Gary Boal. So that's how it's pronounced. I'm sure, he, I'm sure he's laughing. I don't think he's Spanish. So Gary O'Boal. Um, Gary O'Boal, is he Irish? Yeah, I'm just putting the O on the end to make it sound more Spanish. Gary O. Um, Gary mm. Boal or Gary Boal, however your, your surname is pronounced, Um he asks the question, if you knew that the next CD you put in your car's audio would be stuck for the rest of your life, what album would you put in? It would have to be something complex that you can discover something new every time. So, I mean, ACDC are basically were my favourite band for like 20 years, but... Their music is simplistic. There's no denying it. They're so good at it, but it is simplistic. So I don't think I would want to be stuck with even their best album, which is Fly in the Wall, for the rest of my life. Uh, so it would have to be something a bit more complex, progressive. Probably Jethro Tull's A Passion Play or Thick as a Brick, something like that. Oh, the- Thick as a Brick. That's a good That's a good call. I, that's one of my favourite albums and that you, is rich i actually prefer a passion really. play i apart, think I've, apart I've, from I've, the daft middle but the hair lost these spectacles i don't i don't particularly enjoy that but it's similar kind of progressive stuff i have to i have to i don't i probably have listened to passion play but not definitely not as much as thick as a brick at one point mm. I, I shared a, a flat with a guy who had it and then i got the album and listened to to it a lot that was like my first jethro toll Album, so I think right. often when you find a band, the first album yeah, that you get from that head, band yeah. it sort of sticks yeah. in your mind, and so yeah, I really like that. Um, I hadn't thought about that. I was thinking if, if it's the rest of my life listening mm, to the same so thing, hopefully. Of, well, yeah, I'm half thinking that you want to find like the longest CD you can get, but <laughs> uh, but um, I think I'd, my favorite band's Queen, and so I and I think they're they're rich enough and diverse enough. Um, that actually a good Queen album um, or you know one of the great Queen albums would actually be good enough to listen to for the rest of my life. And mm. although I've heard it many, many, many times, I think A Night at the Opera by Queen is probably their masterpiece album. It's got Bohemian Rhapsody um, on it. And one of my favourite songs, which is The Prophet's Song, on it. If you haven't listened to that, you love guitars and you like vocals and stuff, you should listen to it. It's basically Brian May's um, opus where Freddie Mercury had his Bohemian Rhapsody as the, the final song of the album. Brian May has Prophet's song, which is the first song on the second side of the album. Um, and it's just incredible, big, massive, epic. Well, I think um, that's that's a word, epic. If you've got something you have to listen to for the rest of your life, I think it has to be kind of epic. Nothing, nothing too yeah. simple. That's something you that, can discover even in your 
tenth year listening to it or twentieth yeah, year and, or whatever. I, for me, I think that the thing that would really draw me to that is the fact that all of the guys in the band wrote songs on that album, and you've got everything from the ballad mm. um, "Love of My mm. Life" through to there's a song, there's some like heavy, real sort of heavy metal um, stuff on there. There's the the sweeping epics. There's almost like vaudeville music hall stuff. So there's real, really diverse the variation, unusual variations as you go through. Yeah. So it feels like um, a journey. Rather, it's almost progressive, really. Mm. I mean, Queen yeah. were quite unusual in their heyday of their sort of diversity of of sounds that they would produce as now on albums, um, unapologetically bombastic as well. Yeah, we I definitely like. have to be some progressive. I think is the word there. Some for me, some like Metallica's Injustice for All or Opeth's Blackwater Park or Death's mm. uh, Human or some. Something really, it's got a lot you can discover with every listen, rather than some like ACDC. Mm. But then I don't have a CD player in my car because uh, I'm a wealthy author <laughs> and I, uh, I have Android Auto and stuff in my fancy Vauxhall Astra. Ah, well done. Well, yeah, I've hardly I've hardly got access to a car now because I'm such a fancy author. Uh, my youngest daughter's just learned to drive, and she's basically taken over the the car. So I I very rarely get to drive now. So that's it. But um, yeah, I think we've we've certainly got a lot of music we could choose from, and I wouldn't really mind most things that I would put on a CD player if I had a CD player in the car. I wouldn't mind being stuck listening to because I normally listen to only things that I like anyway. But uh, yeah, I'm the same. Yeah. So. But from time to time, there, there, there is a, you might buy a new album. You know, back in the day when you bought CDs, you buy a new album of a new band that you're an old band that you thought you'd like, and then think it doesn't really live up to expectations, which would be annoying to have that stuck in your CD player forever. So that's it for yeah, today. That's the, I think. the second of two question episodes, and they were really good questions, and we still we never get through them all. So there's still some left over. So if we didn't answer your question we'll get to it in a future episode hopefully so thanks very much yeah and if you've got any more questions um then please drop them by and we'll do this as a regular slot you know every few weeks or months or whatever we'll we'll record one of these um answer the questions thing it's great thought-provoking for us and interesting um you can let us know on facebook um, facebook.com um slash rock paper swords podcast and also on Twitter at rock underscore swords. Um, you can find out more about our books on matthewharfey.com and stephenamackay.com. The theme music is written and performed and copyrighted by us. Until next time on Rock Paper Swords, it's goodbye from me, Stephen A. Mackay. And it's goodbye from me, it's goodbye from me, Matthew Harvey. And remember, whatever action and adventure you have going on in your life, be kind. Stay safe. And happy reading. Mm-hmm.